Hey, it's Jeremy from Jeremy.net. And I am working on inking the first page of Morningstar issue seven. So I've been doing a lot of my um, layouts and pencils. That's what I've been sharing in the past uh, few months. So now we're on to the inking stage. And on the very first page, there were some things about it that I wasn't happy about. And I realized it's because I wasn't using reference. So, and as I've been using more and more reference in my work, I see how much the benefits are, how great the benefits are. And I'm realizing that I need to, having this happen on the very first page, you think like you come right out of the gate and then you kind of, not quite face plant, but you kind of hit a brick wall or a bump in the road on the very first page, you'd think that it might be disheartening. But having it happen on the very first page kind of inspired me because it made me realize that I need to stay on point. I need to continue to be aware of when things aren't going well in a page. Um, Delijah from Down Under popped into the chat. Hi, thanks for, for popping in. Amaris is also in the chat. How you doing? Thanks for showing up. Um, so this page, and, uh, and Delegis also said that the page looks awesome. Thank you. I'm about to tear this page apart, so I'm glad that you think it looks uh, awesome because my plan is to kick it up to be even better than awesome. So let me tell you the backstory. What's happening on this page, and I'm going to zoom the camera out a little bit so you can see the whole page. Issue 7 opens up with a shot of a deer. Let me take these X's off because these are the pages that I'm with the panels I'm gonna redraw. The way that this page starts out is with a deer wandering out of the forest. This deer, you know, as deer tend to be, it's wary of predators, you know, looks to the right, looks to the left, doesn't see anything, bends down to take a drink. Um, I also see Mario Clemente popping up in the chat. Thank you, Mario. He said the page looks perfect. I appreciate that. Um, well, that means it's only going to get better from here. This might be a case of me being OCD and never being satisfied enough with my work, but I genuinely feel that it is, there's a development that's happening in my brain where mistakes that I did not see before, I'm starting to see now, or not necessarily even mistakes, but just places where my art can be improved. And the ability to see these things comes with the ability to change them and make them better. And hopefully this is a stage of me being able to make art better without having to... The idea is that eventually I'll be able to make these things the way I want them to the first time instead of having to make these corrections. So let me show you what I'm correcting. I had been working at... First off, I'm very happy with the forest and the deer. And also even just these shots of the deer down here. What I was unhappy with is the water. Um, I just kind of figured it was going to be like a, a river flowing down. It wasn't going to be super fast, but just having a, a stream of water flowing down and the deer comes down to, to drink from it. And I'd finished, I did kind of a holding line for all the, for the, the, uh, the deer, the, I kind of blocked in the larger elements of the background, which I'm pretty happy with. I still hadn't finished inking this lower panel. But I just kept looking at this top panel when I got to this stage. Because um, this page, right as it stands now, is like 90% done. There would just be a little bit of details in the deer and in the drawing what's in the water. And then also drawing a little bit of the deer's reflection down here. And this page would be done. But I just wasn't satisfied with the water. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong. Um, obviously, I tried flipping it that didn't seem to make it jump out at me. So step one in fixing problems is flipping the drawing. And if I don't, something doesn't jump out at me as the mistake, step two, reference. Try to look at a real world equivalent of what you're drawing. And that's where things got interesting because I went online, I looked at some photos of actual rivers and flowing water. And then I sat down, I did some thumbnail sketches. Let me bring the camera back, wow. That was my ring hitting the, uh, hitting one of the, the lamps that's above my desk. It wasn't a, a, the, the tight camera bell, which would be funny. Um, 
So I was looking at some pictures online and let me bring this closer so you can actually see the thumbnails. And looking at pictures of rivers, the rushing lines that are going in the direction of the flow of the river, like these top two sketches. Now, from what I observed looking at photos, that tends to happen in very fast moving water, like extremely fast moving, or in narrower rivers. Now, if you're looking at a broad river, what, it, what I visually saw in the photo reference I looked at was that it tends to be more of a zigzag, like ocean waves. Like it's actually moving, if the river is moving this way, the waves of the water are parallel, like it's moving in sheets. Almost as if, like when you're standing at the beach and you watch the waves coming at you onto the shore, imagine if that entire beach was one massive river and the river is moving this way, the flows are moving this way. Um, let's see. Um, I see Joke Man's got a question and I will pop into that in just a sec. Um, oh yeah, so rivers moving in, um, if the river, the flow of the water is this way, I noticed that in rivers that aren't super tight, more, po pops uh, more folks popping into the chat. Uh, William Reed's in there too, hello. Um, joke man, I'll get to your question in a second and everyone else, um, I'm gonna probably ramble for a second and then I will come back and, uh, and pop in and address those questions. So if water is flowing in this direction, I noticed that you know the, the sheets in rivers that are very wide or not moving super fast tend to move more in sheets parallel to the, they move perpendicular to the, the direction of the flow. Now, the other thing I noticed is that when I looked up reference for a deer drinking from water, I, um, I noticed that the, in looking at videos of water moving, as opposed to photos, when you're actually looking at uh, video, the dynamics of water moving tends to be, it looks a lot more complicated. So my, my thumbnails I did of the flow of direction of water are a gross simplification. I started looking at videos on fluid dynamics and I realized that actually understanding how water moves through space can be extremely complicated. And I didn't want to get too caught up in doing these, uh, these reference images, doing reference studies. I just thought, I just want something that's going to look right for this image. So for my intents and purposes, the more zigzaggy ocean wave movement seemed to fit what I felt fits with this visual image. So, you know, I did a couple of quick thumbnails of the actual, once I kind of figured out the direction I wanted of the water for that, I did, I wanted to see kind of what it would look like with these same zigzags with the deer drinking from water. That made me think, hmm, if I'm gonna do that, I should probably look up some reference from a deer drinking out of water. And once I did that, I found a couple of, a video online, I actually did some screen caps of it, and deer, a deer could stand on the banks and stick, it, stick its face down and drink from the water, but from the videos I saw, they actually stepped into the water and drank. So I realized that what I have working here is physically a little bit awkward for a deer. So I actually changed how I was gonna draw that. Um, so let's pop back up and look at some questions in the chat and I'll talk a little bit more about the, the changes I'm making to this page afterwards. So first joke man popped in said, um, on this topic, what am I inspired by? Where do I get my ideas from? Maybe music, maybe works of art and other artists. Well. Let's see. Morningstar is Lucifer's Fall from Heaven told as a Western. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I grew up in a religious family. So for some reason, I think I've been obsessed with angels and specifically demons ever since I was a kid. So I've always been interested in stuff like, I like Ghost Rider is one of my favorite comic book characters. Um, I've never read DC's The Demon, the old uh, Kirby character, even though he's been in a lot of iterations, a lot of comic books. Um, I find him fascinating as a character. I have read a fair amount of uh, John Constantine, uh, Hellblazer, the old original uh, series. Um, hang on, I'm just stepping away to grab a bottle of water, bring that closer. Uh. So for me, I'm definitely inspired. I mean, I've been inspired by almost every movie and book and song I've ever read or listened to just in terms of uh 
you know, being in the world, you experience other people's art and it gives you ideas for art. Um, I would say for music, I have, there's this particular art print I have that is inspired by a band called the Divix. It's called Siren Song. You can see it, I think it's still up on, if you go to jeremy.net on my website, um, there's, I think I still have prints of that piece. Um, but it's a woman kissing a man and kind of sucking the soul out of his body. And in the song, the, it tells the story of a guy who's driving down a road at night. He sees a beautiful woman by the side of the road. He's just seduced and entranced by her. He ends up running off with her, leaves his family, his wife, his kids. You get to the end of the song, she finally kisses him and she sucks his soul out of his body. Turns out she's the angel of death, which is why he could not resist her and why she took him away from her. He always found the imagery very, very powerful. But I listen to a lot of different music. Um, I, you know, I listen to some hip hop. Uh, I grew up listening to a lot of metal and a lot of rock music. A lot of Black Sabbath, I would say, is very inspirational to me visually, which, again, a lot of angel and devil imagery in their music. So that's kind of stuff. Um, when it comes to other artists that I'm inspired by, I would definitely say Bill Sienkiewicz is one of my big inspirations, um, along with David Mack and Ashley Wood. They're also artists who have a little bit more of an expressionistic and multimedia work in theirs. And the thing that I respond to a lot in their work is that they're not necessarily visually representing exactly what you're looking at, but they are drawing sort of the internal, the, the things that are impossible to represent, the soul of a thing, how something feels. They tend to include those, those expressionistic aspects, those ethereal aspects in the visual part of their artwork. And that's why I find interesting is drawing those, those intangibles. In terms of more traditional comic book artists, I would definitely say Walt Simonson, John Byrne, Frank Miller. I mean, a lot, all of the murderous rogues that people are really influenced by. Just the other day I was reading the, um, there's a series called The Modern, Modern Masters and tends to have a lot of comic book illustrators and it's put out by Tomorrow's Publishing, and they have a wide variety of comic creators they have in there. And I've got you know several of their books, but I was just reading the one by uh, on Ron Garney, and it covers a lot of his uh, Captain America work, um, his run on the on uh, Wolverine they did with Jason Aaron. Then it has a lot of his earlier stuff from when he first started in comics, um, working in um, I don't know if he was drawing just Ghost Rider or whether he was drawing one of the books out of uh, Marvel's horror line that they had had. Um, briefly, but uh, yeah, those are those are just some of my inspirations just off the top. Um, let me go down into a few more questions. So Amaris Joseph is asking, since I'm starting my comic soon, is it better to use your friends for reference or face designs, or should I, or should I hire models as my reference, or maybe look online? Well, I know for myself. I, didn't, I don't, even now, I don't have the budget to hire models. I have tried a wide variety of different types of reference for, for actually creating my characters. When it comes to the model reference for the poses, these, I've had times where I've had friends pose in all of the, like I took the thumbnails for the entire issue, and I think it was like issue three of Morningstar. And at that point, I had a friend of mine basically act out all of the thumbnails. And in acting out all those thumbnails, I took shot photos of him in all the different poses and I had different props. So he played um, different cowboys in the story. He played different demon characters. He kind of acted out all of those and took photos of him with appropriate props in all those scenes. I found that that amount of reference slowed me down quite a bit and I actually shied away from reference for a couple of years and only recently have I gotten back into it. Um, let me see, hold on just a sec. I have a small blue box that I keep in my art bag. Inside this box, I have a few sets of these gray uh, figures, plus the little accessories that come with them. I've got two males and two females. So I use these a lot for just poses. 
So any particular pose that a character is taking, these things do the job in terms of helping me keep them in proportion. Um, I, well, I'm getting off of the topic because I think your question is just what should you do? And the question is, use what reference you have avail available to you and what reference works best. Some people would much rather have a physical person posing for them instead of using these little figures. For me, I have sort of a mobile drawing kit and I try to set up so I can draw whenever and wherever so I don't have to shoot all of my reference in advance. That's why I like using these. But if you look at uh, the comic creator Paulo Rivera, um, I forget the name of his blog, but if you Google it, just Google his name, you'll find his blog. He shares a lot of his reference and he tends to pose himself or he'll occasionally have like his wife or a friend pose. But a lot of the poses are just him using a camera and a timer and taking photographs of himself for his, uh, for his comics. You can see the fact that it's a lot of like mainstream Marvel characters that he's posing for and you get to see how he translates his, his reference into the comic page. So whether it's posing yourself, whether it's getting friends to pose, whether it's getting little figures, what I say is try all of them and see what you like. In terms of facial reference, I tend to sketch out of my head to try and imagine what I feel like the character should look like in terms of doing thumbnails. My general rule for reference is thumbnail first, then find reference that matches the thumbnail instead of looking up reference first and then trying to make your drawings match that look. Um, so that's also true, I would say, for characters as well. It's like I'll try to sketch out of my head and then I'll look up photos of people that have attributes or characteristics that match what I'm going for story-wise. And that may just be finding pictures of different actors and kind of casting my book. It may be that I'll base it on a friend or have a friend pose. So there is no one answer. And that's the thing I think a lot of people get hung up on when you're starting on is you're trying to say, what is the right way to do something? And in art in general, not just comics, but in art, there's a lot of different ways to do things. Um, there, you can get to the point where you may draw something. As long as it looks good and it works, that's the, the main thing. Um, you may have a very unusual process that a lot of people might say, well, that's not how you should do it. But as long as the results work, they tell the story you want to tell, you're happy with it, and people like the work, then um, that's, that's the main thing. Uh, Mario Clemente commented, I always draw very dark water in black and white illustrations. Um, you know, that was one of the things I very much considered was making it just black and then only having the light be where you saw the reflection of the coastline where there's a, a path in there. But to be honest, that probably wouldn't be, well, I think that that would be if you were looking at a less steep angle, if you weren't looking as down, if you were more flat. So I probably am gonna change this a little bit in terms of what type of reflection you see in the water because this is an angle where you're not looking kind of right at the horizon and seeing a reflection up here and a reflection down there. But that was one of the things, where are these little thumbnails I've got? Yeah, that was one of the things I looked at when I first started sketching these out was just trying to do these wave shapes in pure black. And when I did this little thumbnail, a friend of mine at work kind of looked over and, and saw my little thumbnails and I told him a problem that I was working out, that I just wasn't happy with how the water looked. And he looked at these top two and was like, dude, I think you nailed it there. So it's not like either one of these top two are wrong. It's just that this third one feels like what I'm going for. So, you know, again, it's not always about right or wrong. It's, you know, there's a certain intuitive level of all visual storytelling. Um, Joke Man also asks, what do you think about digital artists who use programs and graphic monitors? Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Uh, at work, I use a Cintiq. I have a 12-inch Cintiq at home that I don't use for comics work that often. If I had an iPad Pro instead of just a regular iPad with a... a a stylus, I'd probably be tempted to do my thumbnails with uh, on the iPad instead. The main reason why I do traditional work instead of digital is because I spend all day in front of a computer. When I do my personal work, when I come home, the last thing I want is to sit in front of a monitor longer. So really just drawing traditional is giving my eyes a break and a rest. There's a lot of great advantages to working digital I don't think, I still think it's best when you're learning art, when you're learning how to draw, 
to learn traditionally and then bring those traditional skills to digital. That said, I don't think there's anything wrong with creating art or comics digitally versus traditionally at all. People should use, they're just tools, like a pen, a brush, um, charcoal, whatever you want to use to tell, make the artwork you want to make, that's what you should use. So, on this page again, what, what I had worked through down here, aside from realizing I wanted to have the deer actually step into the water for this, I was sketching out how I was going to draw the deer that's actually drinking from the water. And what I wanted to communicate in this panel was that the deer is drinking from the water and then it happens to look over and I haven't inked, finished inking this part, but in the reflection of the water, it was going to see a tree that's sort of up and behind it. And in that tree is a demon waiting to pounce down on the deer. And then the next page was going to be, this is very light blue, so it'll be hard for you to see, but a demon plunging down into the water and attacking the deer and the deer kind of jumps out of the way and goes running off. Um, Delijah down under jumps in about talking about working digitally. Then to do the undo button makes a huge difference. Yes, that's very true. Um, there's a lot of, particularly even with this, the fact of being able to edit things, because you're gonna, I'm gonna show you, or at least I'm gonna show you the start of me working on redrawing these elements. I'm gonna scan in, I'm gonna make my roughs, scan those in, and then the part you're not gonna get to see is me actually reprinting them onto Bristol board and re-inking just this panel, this panel, and then just the part of here that's in the water. And then I'm gonna composite all that in Photoshop. If I were working digitally, I would just do all of that on the digital device. There wouldn't be any back and forth. There wouldn't be multiple sheets of paper. I, there might be extra, I could just create an extra layer and just redraw it on that layer. Tons of advantages to working digital. I am so not anti-digital. I only work traditionally because, well, there's two, there's a second reason. Mainly one is because I'm in front of a computer all day. But two, also, I think getting, I, getting that inky brush feel I think might be a little bit more difficult in digital. I'm sure if I sat down, found the right brush, found the right settings, I can get the look and feel that I want. But it took me a very long time to get some sort of competency inking with a brush. I had always wanted to ink with a brush ever since the first time I started working with comics. Or ever since I was a kid and I got interested in making comics, I've always wanted to ink with a brush. Now, I still use um, Micron pens. My whole thing is I try to use the brush for everything organic, and then I use technical pens for vehicles and buildings. If it's got a hard edge to it, I want that to specifically have a different structural feel in the drawing than my figures and my environments. So, but beyond that, I really do prefer to just, you know, you know the time I've put into really developing the, the feel, the ability to ink with a brush, I really enjoy that now, and I don't want to let go of that. I actually love the sensation, the way that the paper feels under my, under my brush when I'm inking on it. So it took me such a long time to get to the point where I could do it and get the results that I wanted. I don't really want to give it up. That doesn't mean that artists should not work digitally or that I think people shouldn't work digitally or that I have anything against digital. I am sure at some point in my career, I will make a comic 100% digital. And it does, and who knows, I may make a book like that and decide I'm never going back and I may switch completely over to digital. I may do it and decide, huh, sometimes I like digital, sometimes I like traditional. I may go back and forth. I don't know, I can't see into the future. I try not to make hard rules about these things because when you do, you stop experimenting. When you simply say, I'm only gonna make art this way or this is how things should be, the more you create firm, hard rules for yourselves, the more that you limit yourselves to some degree. What I like to think of is I have guidelines for how I'm gonna approach a particular project and I try to stick within those guidelines just because you do need constraints to some degree. Otherwise, I'm gonna paint one page and then I'm gonna do airbrush on another, and then I'm gonna do another page digital. And there are artists who can make that work. Like if you're a, like someone like Bill Sienkiewicz, you made this multimedia genius or Ashley Wood, but for me at the skill level I'm at right now, 
I do find it better to just stick with one approach, but to be flexible about how I use that approach and say, well, let me try out different things within it. So, so that's that. I'm wondering if I ever made a, a video that was specifically called um, traditional versus digital because, oh, I see Vince Moore also popped in the chat. What up, Vince? So there's nothing wrong with old school tools or newfangled ones. You uh, use the tool you need at the time. Couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, Mario Clemente also said the reflections and the lights look great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, oh, the other thing I was going to mention on this page. This shot at the bottom, I thought it was very clever, storytelling-wise, to have the deer see the demon in a reflection. But when I was rethinking how this water was going to look, I started rethinking this shot. And one of the things I thought about was... Particularly if I'm gonna have the deer step into the water, this just, it might be a little bit awkward trying to force all of that into this kind of close-up shot. And even with this angle, it always felt more, like it was definitely visual, visually fudging it. Like it wasn't worked out convincingly. I just sort of like, this is where I need the tree to be. This is where I need the deer's head to be. So that's just how I laid it out. I said to myself, well, if I'm willing to change everything else, why not be willing to at least explore a different execution of this? So that's what I mean when I say trying not to be too rigid in my thinking. Why not be willing to say, well, let me at least consider it. So I thought, what about instead of having the demon up in the tree and you seeing that demon in the reflection, I thought, what if I just do it like a very simple, like a crocodile? Like the deer is down in silhouette drinking from the water and then you just have the demon's head kind of floating like a crocodile. And then the next page, you have the demon splashing out of the water instead of jumping down below. I mean, jumping instead of jumping from above from the tree, it's splashing from below out of the water. And I felt like it still conveys the same story beat. The only difference is that I'm not being clever about the whole reflection. So that means that I'm also going to have to redraw this opening panel, which isn't a bad panel, but I feel like it will give me something closer to what I want story-wise. So this panel is going to get redrawn. Then this panel, this panel, and just the water from that one. Oh, one more little thumbnail that I had. I think this is going to be the thumbnail from when the deer actually crawls like steps into the water. So this panel, this little thumbnail I did here is what's going to replace this shot. So, and my friend, uh, Ion Rocks, who hasn't popped up yet, but it wouldn't surprise me if he gets in before this video is over. He mentions that I do tend to over obsess about things and fixing things that don't need to be there and tweaking. The changes in terms of this panel, this panel, and the, the start of the next one, I freely admit that I'm getting into that nitpicky territory. It's not that these changes, it's not that the page is bad right now. It's much more that I'm aspiring to make the best comic art that I can. So I'm just going to swing for the fences. And if I see something I think can kick it up like 10% better, I'm going to go for it. I mean, I'll definitely, there's going to probably be other panels and other pages that I would let stuff like this slide. I think the old main reason why I'm being this much, the why I'm so willing to go an extra mile and make revisions on this page is because it's the opening page of the issue. I think for other pages that I might do, I would definitely let things go. But on this one... You know, it's, it's the start, the, the whole issue is starting out here, and I want it to, I want to put my best foot forward. So, let me take this page, get it out of the way. I need to grab a little bit of drafting tape. Let me 
bring this down a little bit. This will be front and center. Now this particular panel, the fixes should go quickly because I'm really just putting in some expressionistic lines that are gonna indicate the look and shape of the water. I don't need to go in and do the, the fixes that I normally do in terms of flipping. I don't need to flip the, uh, the panel for this particular one because it's just a simple flow of energy. There's not anatomy that I necessarily have to, uh, to correct. Because I don't think that flipping the page helped me with, uh, with this one. And something else I noticed, I have this rock that was there sort of in the middle of the, uh, the river. I don't really need that rock. It's not helping me. I think what I'll do is I'll go in with a red pencil and because I'm not flipping it, the red pencil is going to be more for just blocking in the shape of the whole river and maybe blocking in what the perspective is going to be. And then I'll just go over it with pencil. Let's see here. It's my little handy dandy art case. I keep my brushes in here. The microns, my handy dandy Sakura electric eraser. Then I've got a brush pen, a Sharpie, a couple more microns, a mechanical pencil. Then I've got some Ticonderogas, my red pencils, a blue pencil, and I have a tiny makeup brush. Why do I have a tiny makeup brush? Because this brush, which I used to sweep off my erasures, is a pain in the ass to carry around in my art bag. And the bristles of it would get damaged to the point where the hairs are falling out. There'd be a bunch of hair in my bag. But so I use this little makeup brush and whenever I'm doing a lot of erasing, I just sort of sweep it away, the tiny little brush. OCD, perhaps. Pencil sharpener. All right. Let me sharpen this red pencil. Interesting, I'm missing one of my pencil holders. All right, so the main thing is I wanna make sure that when I scan this in, that I'll be able to line it up with the existing page. So I'm gonna mark the corners of this panel. To be honest, I only really need to mark this corner, this corner, that corner, and that corner. That should give me everything I need to line up the, uh, the page the way I want. It doesn't matter if it shifts a little bit. In fact, I will probably intentionally draw over it and then so that the, when I do ink it, it'll probably ink over these panel borders because I know I'm just gonna cut that out in Photoshop. In fact, I can just sort of put a rough line in there, a rough guideline. So, Let's kind of lightly rough in this riverbank. A lot of times when I'm eyeballing perspective and I'm not really taking the time to work it out, I try to just figure out what are, like I'll try to go to the far ends 
like let's say all the way over to this edge and then all the way over to this edge and I try and say all right well what you know if I did go out and pull out my layouts I could probably figure out exactly where my uh, my vanishing point is but it's probably somewhere about in here but a lot of times what I'll do is I will try to not make the the if i make two lines that are diverging and i make them out here that's going to make the ones that are all the way at this edge like parallel or even sticking outwards so what i try to do instead is i try to go to the far edges of my my image and i try to make sure that the distances the the ways in which these lines converge and diverge. I try to make sure that they're not too extreme. So let's, uh, and then I'll try to find a place in the middle and I'll try to make a line that's about in between those two. And then in there, something that's about the, in the middle of those two. So this is just sort of a quick shorthand perspective. Now, what bothers me is that the way I kind of drew this, I feel like you still, even at this far end, still feel like I should be looking at the water coming towards me instead of it running past me. So. Let's see what happens if I draw it like that instead. So we're getting into an area where I'm sort of cheating the optics to try and get the effect that I want. Let's see that I put that there. You know what, now I see what's bothering me. If I keep... the perspective lines a little bit more horizontal as opposed to vertical, then it hopefully will make this feel like we're looking across a broad plane of water. as opposed to where we're like right on the other side, like as if the, where you're standing is kind of farther away. All right, so we've got that kind of roughly blocked in. I see William Reed commented, that's good compositioning. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I definitely, composition is something that I probably spend the most time on. Um, Cause I spend a lot of time on my, my thumbnails trying to work out the visual storytelling. And it's interesting because it's a constant balance between what is a good shape design what's visually appealing and aesthetic, and then what tells the story well. Because that's the thing. You can have a really pretty picture, but if it doesn't communicate composition, very much leans itself, lends itself to enforcing where you want the eye to go, and that's a form of storytelling. So, I think I just want the waves to be a little bit more dense kind of at this 
left end. And then the right end is just a little bit closer to the, the, the viewer. Still not 100% happy with it. It's like Prince, sometimes I'm like my mother. She's never satisfied. And I think as much as I wanted it to still feel like it's flowing towards you at this end, I do need some perspective down here. That's sort of what it's missing. It's funny because when I was doing sort of the, the thumbnails and the research on this, sort of when I realized that I have a tremendous amount of study to do on the dynamics of water or the shape of water as it were I still haven't seen that movie I know it's a, it's a damn shame everyone says that it's brilliant it's one of Del Toro's best films um, it fell by the wayside of the the curse of the creator it's like do I want to go and and watch cool stuff or do I want to try and make cool stuff and I ended up spending my time trying to make it. Although now that I am thinking about it, I might be able to talk my wife into watching it tonight. We'll see. I had mentioned The Exorcist because she had never seen The Exorcist before. And mind you, that's not happy time, good Saturday evening uh, viewing. It's, you know, it's a dark, heavy movie. But I would definitely be willing to sit through it again because she does like supernatural, um, psychological horror. And I just think it's a phenomenal movie. I mean, it's scary as all hell, but it's one of the most amazing movies of all time. But if I actually had to say, what am I in the mood for? I think I would much rather watch Shape of Water than that. So we'll see. We may not end up doing that at all. We may just end up watching uh, episodes of Community. We'll see. see William Reed commented again something sequentials are hard others think it's fun to play around with it's a mindset you know that's very true very very true because for instance just the fact that I was making corrections on this page I know many people who would be frustrated by being like oh no matter what I do this page isn't coming out right and there's mistakes I was so super excited that I could discover a way to make a page better that I was just enthusiastic. You know, I was looking forward to, to sitting down and coming here and making these corrections because, I mean, we all want to make good art. And the fact that I found something that would help me make a page I'm working on better, I'm like, how, how can you not be excited by that? It's, it's like we always want to say, well, how do I make this better? How do I make better art? And when someone gives you the steps to do it, you're like, oh, that's too much work. It's a pain in the ass. I look at it like if someone gives me the steps, says do these steps, your art will be better. I'm like, oh my God, that's awesome. So me figuring out that if I go look at some reference, look at pictures of rivers and come back and redraw it based on um, the information that I gain, like that's super exciting to me. And I think storytelling is definitely the same way. Like there's a hundred different ways to tell a story. There's no 
one right answer. Depends on the mood you want. It depends on the individual person's storytelling voice and style. And so for storytelling, yeah, there's just, you can look at it as like this big, heavy task for you to, to combat. Or you can look at it as, oh, I'm learning and hey, I like to draw. Just the kind of the attitude I try to bring to everything, whether it's, it doesn't mean that it isn't difficult work, but difficult or easy, I still try to just remember that I enjoy the act of drawing. So kind of like with figure drawing class. Figure drawing class, I love it. It kicks my ass a lot of the time. But getting my ass kicked, I've learned to enjoy that act of sort of like submitting yourself to the act of trying to gain knowledge and figure stuff out. And it, you know, busting your chops a lot of the times. I'm fine with that because that's, that act of working through an artistic problem is probably one of the most interesting things about making comics to me is the never ending level of problem solving. to try and loosen up the uh, the spaces and kind of convert as I get closer to the viewer more light lines versus dark lines or leaving larger gaps between the light and the dark So I've been on for uh, 47 minutes. I will probably stay on for a full hour. Or so I will be on here working on this page for another, you know, 12 minutes or so, 12, 13 minutes. Just to let you know, that way if you had any other questions, just to let you know, you know, a little more time to get them in. I do wish that I had gotten farther on this page or got a chance to start doing, you know, I'm probably going to be finished with this one shortly and move on to the next one, next panel. But that happens a lot. I sit down to draw and I tell myself I'm going to run through a whole bunch of uh, art. I kind of thought over the course of this video I'd have time to do this panel, the other two panels on this page, and maybe even start the, uh, the fix to the, uh, the following page. But that looks like that will have to wait for another time. William Reed also commented, he's starting a figure drawing club using costume models, Elvis, Santa Claus, pirates. Good on you, man. That's awesome. Um, I think that that's one of the, the tough things is being able to find a good place to work from a model. Um, I'm lucky because I live in LA and there's a lot of figure drawing that happens here on a daily basis. There's different uh, art studios and, and instructors instructed as well as uninstructed workshops all over the place but for a lot of people they have a hard time finding some place to study so the fact that you're doing it um you know what yeah definitely that that's awesome if you're looking for people um william to, to join your group Please feel free to post uh, any information you have about it in the comments. Um, you're in the east coast of Canada. Yeah, go ahead and, uh, and post a link. You know what? You can post a link to me, and if the chat for some reason takes it out because it thinks it's spam, I'll try to find it and put that link back in in the description for the video. And so anybody who's in the east coast of Canada that's looking to join a, uh, a sketch group, maybe you guys might uh, be able to link up with William and... You know, hang out, draw in person, study some some costumes.
yeah. All right. This panel is feeling pretty close to done there. So yeah, normally I flip them, but in this case, as it's just me doing uh, different sheets of water, I think I may end up, yeah, removing some, some of these here, putting some larger gaps in. And maybe taking this large piece up here and moving it into, or breaking it into a couple of smaller ones to give a little bit more of a sense of depth. But yeah, if I pull this off there, You know what's weird? I'm just looking at this. I'm still not 100% happy with it. I think the challenge is because this thumbnail that I did, which is exactly what I want, is at a much farther scale. It's at a scale that's much farther away than this shot of the deer on the coastline. I mean, on the, not coastline, but on the riverbank. This might be one of those Photoshoppy things where I actually do end up going in and just redrawing it in Photoshop. Yeah, I will set that aside. And maybe I will ink it traditionally. Maybe I will redraw it just in Photoshop. In fact, I may redraw it in Photoshop to figure out exactly what I want to that fits this page. Like draw it in into here instead of you know whiting the whole thing out. Just bring that in, in Photoshop. So yeah, I'm, again, jump jumping in using some digital tools to solve the problems as needed. Um, let's see here. William Reed asked, at Jeremy, is, uh, is you on Facebook? Um, I don't know if it's at Jeremy if on Facebook because I have a personal page and then I, I have my personal page and then I have a uh, Jeremy Burley comic books and art on there. But you know what? On my, um, on my YouTube channel, in the top links, there's a link directly to my, uh, my Facebook page. You can get to it from there. So yeah, just go, go to my, uh, the homepage of my channel and it should have links there, and you can follow me back from there. Uh, let's see. Madness Jack chimed in. He said, uh, I know nothing about the figure. I know nothing about figure drawing nor drawing itself. Where do I start? Um, well, I would say there's two things. One is getting a good book to study from, and two is getting in front of a model. I personally think... John, uh, not John, John Ham, or John Ham, not J I was gonna say Jack Ham, but it's not uh, Jack Ham. It's uh, Andrew Loomis. Andrew Loomis's Figure Drawing for All It's Worth, I think, is an excellent book for beginners. Um, I would definitely say if you can find either at a junior college, you don't necessarily have to be at an art program, but um, any local um, community college or junior college will have art classes that should be open to the public. You could take a basic, now you should definitely check whether it's a figure drawing class or a drawing class in general. Because if a general drawing class, I'm doing bowls of fruit and just boxes, and those things are interesting and worthwhile to draw, and you learn things that will help you draw the figure. But 
if you're really interested in figure drawing, you might as well just dive in and draw the figure. So you can see whether it's a class that has models, so a figure drawing class. Um, the other thing I would also mention is there's a lot of great figure drawing instructors on YouTube. Um, there's some videos from my figure drawing instructor, Carl Ganas. It's Carl with a K and the Ganas is G-N-A-S-S. -S. There's also, I mean, the big one that I look at a lot is Stan Prokopenko. If you just look up proko.com, P-R-O-K-O, look up his, look up, just type proko into YouTube. His channel will come up, watch all his videos and watch them with a sketchbook in your lap and draw from them like he's teaching you a class. That's a great place to start. Um, Jeff Watts has a lot of great videos. His videos, a lot of them I noticed talk about more of the philosophy of drawing and learning and teaching art. There aren't as many that are as instructional, but then he also has nights where they post feeds from, um, there, it's a, he has a figure drawing school in, I don't know if it's Carlsbad or if it's in San Diego in general, but it's in Southern California near San Diego. And sometimes they have Friday night workshops and they will just live stream from either his drawing board or from some of the instructors there just while they're working on working from the model. But um, I mean, there's lots of great drawing instructors on YouTube also. There's Modern Day James has a great channel. Um, I and mean, the list goes on and on. I, I can list them all off the top of my head and I would definitely forget some great people whose videos I'd look at, I I've looked at. Um, yeah. Getting in front of a model, getting a good art book, and, and studying. You just, it just takes a lot of time. But it's not time like, oh, I need to put in the hours. It's figuring out what you want to learn and spending your time focusing on improving those things and developing the skill to say, what am I drawing that's right? What am I drawing that's wrong? And how do I improve at this? Let's see. Another one I see Ed Mix popped into the chat. He said some of the best, like Alex Ross, use reference. There's almost no purpose to try and struggle to draw something for memory that already exists in real life. Um, you know what? I very much agree. There's, I mean, I am not a photorealistic artist. You can tell even from this forest I drew, even though it, I feel it looks like a forest with mountains in the background, but it definitely doesn't look like a photo. And there are artists who can draw in pen and ink and brush and make it look photorealistic. I've studied realism at different points in my life, and I realized that I am not a realist, but even somebody who does illustrative work or full-on cartoony work can benefit from reference. <clears throat> because in order to exaggerate something or to draw a heightened or surreal version of it, it helps to understand what the real thing is and how it's put together. With somebody like Alex Ross, it's a must. He definitely works from the Norman Rockwell method where he actually shoots his own photo reference and you know, works directly from, you know, he picks models specifically, he's got ones that look like different combo characters and he will, he casts the, whatever project he's working on and, and sets, up, sets up so he'll take very elaborate photo shoots in costume. Um, a great book to get if you want to get a look at that process, there's two books. One is Norman Rockwell Behind the Camera. And that is a book where it has some of Norman Rockwell's most famous works, his paintings. Then it has side by side all of the photo reference that he art directed. He's not an actual photographer. What he would do is he would bring somebody in who was a photographer. He would pose the model. He would sit down and show the photographer what he wanted. The photographer would really just make sure the it was well lit and would snap the picture. So it's almost like... Rockwell was the director, and the photographer was the DP, the director of photography for a movie film. Um, that book is great on showing his process, but the one thing that's missing from that book is they don't show a lot of his thumbnails. And that's critical, because in terms of realism, the one thing that I always, that I think, the one thing I think a lot of people don't realize when it comes to working from reference is they feel like if you're just copying a photo that it feels stiff. But if the photo, if you're right, I mentioned this earlier in the stream, the photos and the photo reference should come from your ideas. And Rockwell would do sketches and thumbnails, a lot like I had these little like doodles of water and doing a little, you know, a thumbnail of a deer coming out of the forest. 
he would make sketches and thumbnails first. Then he would have photographs taken. He would cast his, uh, his paintings or his photo shoots, and then he would have those photos taken based on his thumbnails. And that was the reference that he would blow up and then trace onto artboards or just very carefully do a reproduction. In fact, he struggled for a long time about using a, uh, a projector to project his art on it because there was for a long time the idea that it was cheating. But there were so many artists that were doing it and using it and getting ahead and getting a lot more work done and getting it done much faster that he eventually gave in. And then that, once he started doing it, he's like, why was I fighting it for so long? So it's not that you just find a photo, project it on a board and trace it. If that photo is based on something that came out of your head, it's going to have you in it. And that's something that I didn't understand until just a few years ago. I've been drawing for over two decades now. And only in the last like two or three years have I only started to really get an understanding of how photo reference is properly used. And now that I'm getting that understanding, I'm gonna use it more and more in my work. So we've been on for an hour now, and all you really got to do was hear me explain why we're correct on this page and watch me draw a little bit of water and pencil over this drawing. Um, water that I may end up redrawing anyway in Photoshop. So that will, will wrap it up for now, but I'll put a link in the chat to my newsletter if you wanna see what I'm working on throughout the week. I, I post stuff um, on my blog and I send a weekly newsletter of my works in progress. You can see what else I'm up to. And you can also check out my website if you wanna see um, comics that I have and where they're available on Amazon or from my website. But, uh, yeah, that's it for now. Go be creative.